connected smart home products and services can greatly improve the customer experience for CSPs, leveraging partnerships and ecosystems to create practical and innovative solutions. I'm Guy Daniels and joining me now from Germany is Boris Maurer, who is European Lead Communications and Media Industries with Accenture. And also Tom Guy, Chief Product Officer Vodafone Smart Tech, joins us from the UK. Hello, very good to see you both. Boris, in a recent COVID-19 impact report from Accenture, 92% of consumers and businesses surveyed said their CSP has met or exceeded their expectations in their response. And 62% of consumers trust their CSPs for their data security. Now, CSPs already enjoyed a high degree of customer trust and now it's increased further. Trust is important, but what's the relevance of CSPs to customers? First of all, Guy, thank you for that question. First of all, it's great news. Isn't that fantastic that um, people now acknowledge the trust um, uh, that they are giving into their service providers when they basically sitting at home, disconnected from their co-workers, disconnected from their loved ones. And they find out that actually what keeps them together and keeps them working and living and also living together is um, the essential services that CSPs provide to them. And, um, and that actually, I think, is at the core of why um, now consumers got it that actually um, it's so important that the CSPs are around and are providing this essential service. And, um, and so I think this is something which gives um, the CSPs a new platform um, to build more essential services into the home, but also to the connected office. Um, that are very relevant to the people now because we are changing all the way we are living, we are playing, um, and also how we are moving around. Um, and CSPs will be an essential part of all this change and will enable it and make it happen. So I think it's great news and a second chance for um, take us around the world to grab it um, and play a more essential role and more central role uh, in service provisioning to the home and to the people um, into the future. Indeed, thank you, Boris. Tom, can you share how Vodafone is planning to deliver practical and innovative solutions to its smart home users? And which of these areas do you see as being most important to improve or enhance the user experience? Yeah, I think I would start with um, one of the challenges with smart home is it's, it's just not living up to the dreams of, of what customers were hoping for. You know, you don't see many customers going into a store or going online and saying, I want to buy smart home. So I think, you know, people are still trying to solve point products. And as a designer, that's that's what we try and or designers, that's what we try and focus in on. So um, you know, people don't really care about a camera being in a fridge, but, you know, they do care about maybe turning on the lights to make it look like someone's at home or who's at the front door, you know, for example, with, with solutions like Ring. So I think, you know, that from a Vodafone point of view, we start with that customer problem and we are single minded in solving that problem. There are a number of problems that can be solved in and around the home. And obviously we use technology where needed, but not technology shouldn't be the thing that, that drives the innovation. It always, always should be the customer problem. And Tom, is it possible to design a service or system that brings the variety of different smart home applications together? Because there are a lot of them to improve the overall customer experience. Well, I think, you know, again, I sort of, you know, I'll, I'll always come back to the answer on, on the customer. It's what the customers want and, and not just the 1%. What is it the mass market need? You know, are they really that fussed about that there's a number of smart home providers or do, or do they just want their problems solved elegantly, swiftly by those providers? So I would always start with, you know, the platform that we should all be working from is amazing customer experiences. You know, that's what we should do. And I don't think we have that through um, many technology uh, partners that are going into the home. Um, but I think, you know, if we can all start with that, then I think we start to solve some great problems. And, you know, it's about real life. It's not about, um, you know, trying to home automate the whole, uh, you know, the whole of the home. You know, so it really is trying to come to what, what is it? What is it I want to try and do? You know, so whether it was um, accessing your heating and cooling from, from uh, remotely, 
as I say, you know, keeping an eye on an Amazon parcel that's been delivered and it hasn't been stolen. A lot of the times these problems are, you know, fairly uh, focused and, and they're not about, you know, something uh, like some AI creating and managing your, your whole home. Um, I think there's a number of important solutions for us to be looking at. But, you know, I think there are, the problem is the press seem to get hold of the ones that, you know, seem to have a great headline, but they don't really um, hit or talk to most customers. Boris, what's your view on designing a service that, that brings these different smart home applications together? So I think, um, thank you for that question. I think it's absolutely necessary because if you um, look at a lot of what we're seeing in the smart home, and I completely agree with Tom, um, this is not delivering on the promise that the smart home has given. Um, if we um, uh, take the example um, that Tom um, just mentioned before of the doorbell, um, uh, what solves the end-to-end um, uh, -end customer experience is actually that you have a doorbell, um, that you have a camera um, that actually picks up who is in front of the door, and then probably um, I'm waiting for somebody, but I'm sitting in front of my TV um, and I do have a TV controller. So uh, what's happening in this moment is somebody rings at the door and I would love to see what is happening in the front of my door on my TV. And probably I want to just use the device that I have in my hand to actually get the job done and open the door if um, I want to let the person in who is in front of that. Um, that actually is a an interconnected, interoperable experience, which only works if you can join those things to, together. And what that means is that you actually need to join the data together that is flowing there, and that you want to have somebody to join up the data from the bell, from the camera, um, to my TV and to my controller, and allow them to um, join things together and give me a new use of the device that I'm having in my hand. Um, that all can only work if, um, if I trust somebody to operate this data, because I don't want to have somebody around me organizing all my data without me knowing and without me trusting this person or this um, device or this company who is providing the service for me. So it's all already now that this whole thing that to create a customer experience hinges on the trust that I have into this service. So trust and customer experience work together and it will be absolutely essential to create those great customer experiences that we want to have from the future home um, if there is a trusted party who can join this data together to excite me and enlighten me with the experience that they can create around it. Tom, what's the broader application of devices that not only integrate with the home, but go beyond it? Um, I think, you know, again, it's that, um, you know, designing for the customer, designing for the, for the key use cases and the problems, you know, how do we make that customer life just that little bit easier? You know, we, we started off with, um, with the Tracker product earlier this year, and it was just about, you know, how do I bring things that are important to you closer to you? You know, and I think there's a number of that um, that sort of peace of mind elements that uh, that can be built out that we're looking at, at Vodafone Smart Tech across a number of different um, age groups, you know, in in and out of home. Um, but again, I, you know, I think the um, the problem identifying the problem for, for the customer, I think, becomes quite simple. You know, it's a is my home safe? Is it up and running okay? Is there anything that anything about to go wrong that I need to keep an eye on? Where is everyone? You know, the, the, a lot of these things aren't too difficult. And I think you also, one of the challenges that we also find is what's the simplest way of solving that problem? You know, what's the, what's the, what's the least amount of technology I'm going to need? And quite clearly, you know, as, as um, Boris mentioned as well, which is also the um, amount of data that we take is not just the not just the trust, but just taking enough data to be able to do the job as well um, makes a big difference. Um, you know, people know while they'll put a um, find me location, for example, on a map because you're, you're you're giving up some of that information to get something back. And, and again, it's no different in smart home uh, technology and, and innovation. But like I say, I do feel as though, and, and you know, times where some really good um, uh, manufacturers have jumped straight to the technology solution rather than thinking seriously about is that going to 
is that going to help the customer at all? Is that going to really change their life and, and what they do and how they interact with their home? Um, and you can honestly say, you know, over say the last ten years, I think the the examples are, are few and far between. And as a lead on smart home products and services, how do you encourage and foster partnerships and ecosystems to support Vodafone's vision for its customers? Yeah, I think with um, with the word ecosystem, is everyone sort of jumps to it, you know, talks about it has to be an ecosystem um, before you actually work out what you want to do. And I think, you know, I'd, I'd always use Apple as a great example of, you know, they never thought about the app um marketplace ecosystem before they built a very very good experience you know and then the app ecosystem followed suit and it's no different here i think it's about um when we identify um problems that we're that we are focusing on designing it doesn't mean that we have to build all of those from scratch some of those will be um partnerships that you want to create and make um carefully curate at the time as well i also don't think it's a case of just making a load of partnerships to try to, to force that ecosystem you know it really is about um coming back to that you know customer uh, challenge the design that you're trying to create what you know what is it we what is it we want to do um and there's some great examples you know there's certain products in and around the home that that we just would never want to recreate or redesign but maybe want to connect into them to be able to provide a um, extra level of detail or granular information to the customer to make sure that they feel as though their home is up and working okay, you know, whether that's uh, you know, certain alarms that are going off, for example, you know. Um, so I think, you know, there's, 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 definitely, um, there's definitely great um, partnerships that way. And then also, and it's an obvious one, but, you know, we do partner with some fantastic manufacturers um, world-class uh, industrial designers, you know, you know, even those for me are part of my overall uh, design and product ecosystem, even though, albeit they're not customer facing. And let's look at the devices themselves. Will we see different types of devices for different users? For example, children wanting something that's totally different from what their, their grandparents want. And if so, how do you go about this? How do you approach this? Yeah, unfortunately, not everyone wants the same thing. But, um, you know, I suppose that's what makes a designer's job um, exciting. Look, you know, we, we have a style of product which is um, very, very uh, heavy on the one to one customer labs, you know, really sharing designs, asking customers to touch and feel, interact with the product, whether that's the hardware or, or, the, or the digital interaction. And from that, from that process, you really do get a sense of what um, customers want. You know, look, there's a little bit of a leap of faith as a designer. You know, you, you're, you are putting a few hypotheses out there at the beginning to prove and disprove, um, especially from an industrial design um, point of view. But you sort of, you know, from speaking to the customers, you sort of get a sense of what is it they are struggling to do today? What is it that, what is it they can't do? And a lot of the times, you know, the, the, the challenges are very similar between um, demographics and then, then it's just about sort of tailoring that point, um, that point at the end of, of, of the design. But you're absolutely right, you know, in terms of, you know, we've been doing stuff with, you know, kids or um, the elderly or families, uh, flats, homes, you know, all of the all different um, elements. And then obviously you apply uh, the Vodafone territories across all of that. You know, there is a, there's a lot of different needs albeit always, um, quite interestingly, quite a lot of common needs as well. Boris, with all the use cases that Tom has cited there, does 5G have a role to play in the home experience? How will it impact the experience? And what are some of the considerations that need to be factored in as CSPs and consumers, if you like, upgrade to 5G? So if you look at the situation today, um, uh, people that have a smart home, very often need to deal with five, six or seven different technologies, um, how they connect objects in the home and how they want to interwork them. That is hard. If you, if you, um, you, you think it should be easy, but um, typically even guys who know really how to um, deal with do-it-yourself smart home kits, they uh, see something like it, bring it home, and then it takes them two and a half hours on average to make it work in their home. So this is just um, not working and it takes too long. 
Um, 5G is the, the standard that actually is designed for connected objects, so directly connecting things to the network. So we are sparing the onboarding. Um, we are also sparing a lot of the interoperability challenges that we have today, potentially with 5G. Um, so we are making it easier. So in that respect, um, I have high hopes that 5G will really help us. Um, the next thing is just because um, 5G will be everywhere um, and so many objects will connect to 5G. Um, once we basically solve the trust problem and, um, and make them available for services, service creation will be much easier because you can think about a much more diverse set of uh, resources that you can have a, a, actually leverage to create new services. So that will be fantastic. And then finally is what is at the core of 5G is that you actually um, create more computing capacity on the edge, so close to the device. So you don't need to have so much intelligence in the device um, that you're connecting, but you can basically compute very close to the device. So you can make a lot of services work uh, where you don't have a lot of computing power in the connected objects around you, but you provide the computing power to basically make complex things work very close to you and in real time. So that is the interaction between the media that I'm watching and what is around me. That is um, uh, it, that we can talk in different languages and everybody understands what is happening. That is that we can have more richer experiences around that. Uh, around us that we can use and leverage um, different connected um, devices to feel, see um, uh, in the future, I don't know, smell um, the different aspects of an experience. Um, that will all come over time, but effectively 5G makes that work. So it makes things, first, they, it makes things simpler. Then it makes um, devices cheaper because you can offload a lot of the uh, compute that is now still on them. Um, and then um, it just creates um, much more thinking room to create new device, uh, new services on top of the connected objects to the network um, over time. And, um, and that will all help to create um, much more richer experiences into the future. A final question to both of you. And if you could briefly, in a single sentence, share your vision for the smart home of tomorrow. And Boris, let me come to you with this one first. So for me, the smart home will involve into the future home. And the future home will be um, the trusted internet that I always have with me so that I feel at home, even if I'm not. Um, and that I'm closer to the loved ones and the things that I really value. Um, so that for me is um, the path that we are on with the future. Great. And Tom, what's your vision for the smart home of tomorrow? Well, I'd echo a lot of what Boris just said. I think I would also start with, you know, maybe losing the phrase smart home. I think, you know, if we're not building anything that is, you know, that is smart, I just don't think it's, um, you know, almost worth talking about. But I do, I do echo that point around it is, it is about trying to get you closer um, to either the things or the people um, that you care about now and, and then there'll be a list of problems to solve on that but for me that that's what it's more about you know this is less about cameras in a fridge this is more about the peace of mind knowing my loved ones are safe great tom and boris thank you both very much indeed for joining us on the program